On that note, our third and final presentation tonight has all to do with connectivity between the two that you've seen previously, with connecting parts of town that may or may not be, you may or may not think they're connected unless you think Vandevenor is the be all and end all of that part of town, being able to get from here to there on foot, on two wheels, safely, comfortably, and supported by taxpayer dollars. Our next presenter, Mark Vogel, is a project manager with the Great Rivers Greenway District. He's worked on this project for Great Rivers Greenway for about a year, but has been working on the Shoto Greenway for a total of about 15 years previously with the design firm HOK. So now we get the connectivity between the two previous presentations, the Shoto Greenway Midtown Loop. Please welcome Mark Vogel. Thanks, Jean. Well, the, the commons and the art walk, I think, are two wonderful projects, and I think it's going to be really exciting to see how these public open spaces and quasi-public open spaces uh, help to transform the districts and the neighborhoods uh, that they're a part of. And so you know, congratulations to your firms and your clients for the, the great work that you're investing in there. Um, just quick background, Great Rivers Greenway District. Uh, we are a regional parks district that operates in St. Louis City, St. Louis County, in St. Charles County, and our mission is really to, you know, promote the, the quality of life in the St. Louis region and make this a better place to live. Um, and we're doing that by developing the River Ring, which is a network of, of greenways, parks, and trails throughout the, the three counties. Um, as Gene said, we, we are tax supported. Um, we have about an $18 million budget, budget right now. We were created in the year 2000 by Proposition C, which created a one-tenth of a cent sales tax. Of that, we receive half of that in the three counties. Um, the other half of that money goes back to the counties, and they're to use that for uh, parks. But so we really operate, you know, for the first you know dozen years or so on what amounts to a twentieth of a cent, you know, which is a really really good bargain for the region for what we've been able to accomplish. There's no sunset on this, so we have this forever in the St. Louis region. Um, last year, very exciting, we passed Proposition P in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. Uh, this is a three sixteenths of a cent, um, of which. Uh, the district receives 30% of that funding for greenway projects, so it, it really you know, adds quite a bit to our bottom line. But this uh, sales tax is also funding a lot of the improvements to the Gateway Arch, the, the uh, City Arch River project. And so you know, we're really proud of, of that work that's being done there. And again, another transformational project that I think is going to be important, not just for, for downtown St. Louis, but for the rest of the region. Uh, currently, we're active in, in about 17 different greenways around the region. Um, we're spread all over you know, all three counties. There's a, you know, a lot of, of parks and trails that have been developed you know, over the years. I um, won't get into the detail on all of them, but you can see that we are geographically dispersed around the region. A lot of our facilities, you know, they follow um, you know, rivers and creeks. We're not just a trail organization. We're really about greenways and about protecting open space, protecting watersheds, um, you know, and all the other uh, amenities that, that come with a, a true greenway uh, development. In the, since 2000, when the district was formed, we have protected over uh, 1,600 acres of land, uh, developed over 100 miles of off-street connection, nearly 300 miles of on-street, and this is part of the, the Bike St. Louis um, uh, project. Well over 150 partners, we can't do anything on our own. I mean, we, we have to leverage funds. We need uh, partners for putting land to, to, together, uh, using public facilities. We've got a great network of nonprofit organizations like the Botanical Garden, um, and we've uh, leveraged almost $120 million uh, since the district was formed. Um, we have a lot of community partners, um, connected uh, 42 communities and counting. And to me, this is one of the, the most exciting things. When we talk about greenways as a, a collection of open space, we're talking about linear parks. And so now we have stitched together over 38,000 acres of open space in the region. That's equivalent to about 30 forest parks. So it, it's truly making a huge impact, impact around the region. Now, one of the projects that, that's very close to my heart, as Jim mentioned, I've been working on this for quite a while. And unfortunately, as, as Paul just said, <laughs> this trail that may or may not go through, I hope he doesn't know something that I don't know, um, we're real close. And so after 15 years of, of uh, planning and design, um, we think that we're, we're very close to uh, turning the first shovel and, and getting this project, uh, making it a reality. 
A lot of people know this image as um, you know the, the more you know high profile uh, uh, portion of Shoto Greenway. This is the the uh, the design for Shoto Lake that was proposed about a dozen years or so ago, just south of downtown. Um, you know the rendering of Bush Stadium there. That was before there ever was a stadium deal. You know this was all part of you know this kind of resurgence resurgence downtown, looking at ways to to reinvest in the city. But really, in my mind, when I describe Shota Greenway, it's more this image. It's connecting Forest Park with the arch and the riverfront beyond. So about a four mile linear park and connection of, of linear open space that'll connect the region's uh, greatest assets with a leg that also comes down here and connects with the Botanical Garden. So Shota Greenway, um, from a regional perspective, it's on the eastern side of, of what we call the River Ring. But as far as the city is concerned, it's really the heart of the region. It's the heart of, of our, our population density and, and the, you know, the, all the activity, that the commerce in the central corridor, and again, connecting those very, very critical public assets, the arch, the garden, and Forest Park. Um, this was the original concept for, for, the, uh, for the Greenway, and if, if I can get a, a cursor here, I'll just point out. So the Shoto Lake was planned for uh, you know, the parking lots that are just south of Bush Stadium and Couple Station. And moving west uh, would really follow the, um, the, uh, the, the rail corridor where Metrolink currently is, just south of I-64, and then have a, a node here at Vanavent, or very close to where uh, we're sitting right now, and then an on-street connection back over here to Forest Park where the land is, is much more constrained and we don't really have the open space, uh, with connections back down to the garden and even a connection up uh, toward Fairground Park. There's a historical precedent for this. Uh, people who know the history of St. Louis understand that when the, the city was first founded, um, the, the city founders, you know, they built a grist mill, as all, you know, young uh, frontier villages had, and, you know, that, that formed a lake, and that, that's really where it came from. Uh, this is one of those 150-year-old tunnels that Paul just mentioned. This is actually under those parking lots uh, south of Couple Station. Um, combined sewer, 13-foot. It's still in operations. Actually, um, MSD just recently... Um, uh, refurbish this and <laughs> after 150 years is actually still in pretty good condition but we do have very very old infrastructure in St. Louis that needs to be addressed. Um, with a lot of this old historical data we've been able to, to superimpose what we believe was the the outline of that 150 acre lake uh, over downtown and it reveals some really interesting things about the development of the city you know, it's where the old stadium and where the new stadium is. Couple Station is right here. You see, uh, you know, the, the uh, Scott Trade Center, the post office, and the leg that even goes into Union Station. This isn't by coincidence. When the lake went away, this was all the available land that was just south of the main spine of the city, which was an extension of Eads Bridge as it came across from Illinois in Washington Avenue. We also put together a series of, you know, historical uh, uh, diagrams that, that really talk about, you know, what, wh where that corridor used to be and if we're to put some of this uh, green infrastructure and this, this old ecosystem back into place, you know, we need an understanding of, of really where it was and, you know, how it, how it works with the fabric of the city today. So this is, you know, what was referred to as the Mill Creek or the, the Little River. And then this is the remnants of, um, of River to Pear. So there's a high spot in between. Again, you know, the Botanical Garden is right about here on, on the southern leg. After the city or the, you know, the village of St. Louis was founded, um, you know, there was the, the first mill that was settled. You know, this is the old San Carlos Fort. Um, you know, the, the, the town grew up right along the edge of, of, um, of the Mississippi River. And as the, the, as the, uh, the village of St. Louis grew, the, the need for, for milling operations grew. And so a, a larger mill was created. And that's that larger 150-acre Shoto Pond uh, that was superimposed over uh, the size of downtown St. Louis in, in the earlier slide. As the city grew, it grew on both sides of the, of the, of the pond, and the pond got polluted. And so this is the, one of the, the uh, latest drawings that we have that really shows the extent of it and how the city was you know, really growing right up against the edge of, of the lake. By the, the mid-1950s, our lake disappeared. So there were cholera epidemics. There are all kinds of other um, you know, environmental factors that sort of forced the, the, uh, the drainage of the lake. Well, it was also the Industrial Revolution, and we didn't need grist mills anymore. We were belching coal into the sky. We were pushing west with the Transcontinental Railroad. 
And where do we put it? We put it right where the flat land was, uh, where, where Shoto Lake was. And so that really you know, shows how the city was, was starting to push west, even though the development pattern uh, still paralleled the Mississippi River north and south. By the uh, World's Fair, the city was growing rapidly. But about this time was when the, the city started carving out public open spaces and developing a, a parks district. And so you know, old drawings of the city, they show where Lafayette Square and Tower Grove and some of the other the parks were. And of course, all the buildings that you know, grew up around the, the, uh, the channelized uh, portion of River de Pere uh, for World's Fair. What's interesting here is that, you know, fast forward back, you know, to the you know, 60s or so, the same corridor um, that was, you know, the lifeblood of, of the industrial, growing industrial portion of the city was now part of the interstate highway system. And so we keep using the same corridor for more and more infrastructure. Um, it was used for Metrolink, which opened in, in 1993. So what the plan is here, now that we understand all this historical context, is to use the exact same corridor where this you know, natural stream was and put a portion of it back in that will connect, again, our, our you know, regional gems of you know, Forest Park, the garden, and the riverfront. So there were some guiding principles that we've always used when we were doing uh, early planning for uh, Shoto Greenway. It, you know, it, first and foremost, it really is an ecological corridor for us. Um, it, it's a, a way that we can harness uh, urban stormwater. We also want to use it for interpretation, uh, history, culture, and education. We think be, that you know, it's also with with all the uh, some of the institutions that are focused on healthcare. You know, there's a big component of, of a story you can tell about a healthy community, both from you know a healthy environment, but also active uh, lifestyle and uh, recreation. And so there's a whole series of overlays that we've done that you know try to interpret how do we put this this um, this uh, uh, ecosystem back into place? How do we actually use this uh, urban watershed and collect storm water and treat it, filter it, um, you know, collect it on site, and then you know hopefully discharge the clean water back into the Mississippi as opposed to into the you know, combined storm sewer? You know, it's it's a very very difficult challenge to do this on a, such a constrained site. As Paul was saying, you know, block by block, it's very difficult. But when you're talking about doing it at you know, a, a regional scale, it becomes even more of a, of a challenge, just assembling the real estate to harness that volume of water. So um, the Midtown Loop, uh, this concept uh, really emerged uh, a few years ago when Metro approached Great Rivers Greenway about an old streetcar line that they own the, the property for. It functions as an alley on the north side of St. Louis. Um, they have no use for this property anymore. And so they said, well, why don't you turn it into a greenway? Well, you know, it's actually a compelling idea. So uh, Christner and SWT were hired a few years ago to conduct a feasibility study for this streetcar line to say, you know, how could that be incorporated into the, the river ring network? And so some really interesting things came out of that, that, you know, it does provide um, this connection between Shoto and the emerging St. Vincent Greenway, and it also serves a very underserved um, set of urban neighborhoods on the north side of St. Louis that otherwise don't have access to the River Ring. So it provides some, some really, really compelling um, ideas and um, you know, rationale for Graver's Greenway to take it on. One of the challenges here, you know, all of our River Ring diagrams talk about the great, you know, the importance of connecting to Forest Park, and yet right now, with um, Centennial Greenway, St. Vincent Greenway, Shoto Greenway, River to Pear, none of them except for Centennial connects to Forest Park right now. As you get closer to the park, the land becomes very problematic. Um, and so that's why another reason why this is a really, really important connection for us. It's also important because of all the different institutions and the commerce, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the culture that happens with, with all these different nodes that, that happen you know, along these different corridors. Um, and even reaching out along the, the uh, Centennial Greenway out to the Danforth Center or up uh, St. Vincent Greenway to, to uh, UMSL. Um, so zooming in at a little finer scale, um, you know, connectivity, you know, the same thing that, that uh, you know, Heather and, and Sung Ho were talking about at the, you know, the site scale, the district scale, we're trying to do at a regional scale about connecting districts and neighborhoods together. And, and that's a great thing that the, uh, that the Greenways can do. Um, you know, so this loop, can really be the way that we move people in another way uh, from Grand Center to St. Louis University through uh, uh, Cortex and the Washington Medical Center BJC complex. 
Now, zooming in a little closer, um, it's important to note that um, you know, we are a multimodal facility. Uh, getting people out of their cars, giving people alternatives to um, alternative transportation, healthy transportation, also, you know, it, it, it's a great opportunity to tie in with, um, with uh, the transit system. And so um, between the Central West End uh, Metrolink Station, the proposed and planned Cortex Metrolink Station, and the Grand Metrolink Station, these are really, really important connections for us to allow people to, you know, kind of expand the, uh, the, uh, um, you know, the distance that they can commute um, either on bike or foot. And so this is how all these, uh, these the, this uh, loop system connects with them. And then the other thing is about the, the high quality open space that's being developed uh, with the Cortex Commons and with the Art Walk. You know, again, we're not really interested in just doing an asphalt path. We were very interested in high quality open spaces that really turn this corridor, this loop, into a linear park. And so just walking you through from one end to another, um, you know, where the land is very constrained and, and uh, we, we, we don't have much real estate to use, you know, it'll, it'll, it, we're probably looking at some, some you know, off-street but, you know, narrow connections that, that uh, walk us from the underpass under King's Highway um, along Clayton Avenue, along Taylor, in the heart of the medical district, and then along the Metrolink corridor that goes, you know, right past all the, the parking garages uh, that serve Wash U and, and BJC. It's a great corridor. Um, right now, it's the back of house, but over time, you know, our intention is that with this high quality open space, people start you know treating that as a as a as a front door instead of a back door. And again, because it 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 uh, accesses the Metrolink stations, we're really seeing this not as so much a recreational user bicycle trail, but this is really a, a commuter trail and a, a commuter um, line, you know, for for walkers as much as or even more so than, than, than bicyclists, especially during, you know, uh, Monday through Friday. As we get into the, the, the Cortex zone, I think that this is really, really great opportunity. When you think about all the uh, Metrolink stations throughout the system, you know, they were, the line was put in in these industrial um, uh, corridors and, you know, we kind of inherited the land that was given to us. This is one of our first opportunities in the whole Metrolink system to actually land a station in a park. And so when you walk out of, out of the, the, the train onto this platform, you're going to be in this very unusual, wonderful uh, space. And so Paul was describing you know, the north-south connection of the commons. Uh, the other component to it is this uh, east-west connection uh, from Boyle to Sarah. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a second. So you know, moving further on uh, east towards Sarah, um, it's true, they, they debated whether or not the station should be at Boyle or Sarah, somewhere in between. By providing this Greenway connection, you know, those th thousand miles you know, to the east, the station really can serve both streets. And so you could put a, a metro sign on this side, and really, you know, the station extends that far. And so we really think that it's, it's you know, all these systems work in conjunction with each other. Um, going a little bit further to the east, next time you're on the train, Notice what happens when you uh, go over Vandeventer. There's another rail spur that goes over Vandeventer that ties in with uh, this property that's been uh, talked about, uh, this Midtown uh, Station uh, project. And so what we'd like to do is use that old rail spur that will bring us up Spring Avenue through St. Louis University and then up Spring Avenue again to uh, Grand Center and tie this in with the Art Walk. And so again, all these systems tie in together uh, we're working with uh, St. Louis University and uh, with Grand Center on these projects. They're very supportive of this notion of, of bringing people, you know, back down to all the activity and, and um, uh, you know, things that are happening down here in the Cortex area. Um, so this is the, uh, the area where the, the uh, 4240 building is. This is the, the commons, probably an old rendering of it, I apologize. And this is where the new Metrolink station will be constructed. We just received a, a very large um, a Tiger, it's a, a, a FTA grant for constructing the station. So St. Louis was the recipient of $10 million to build the station, but it also will provide money to, um, to build this first portion of Shoto Greenway. And so after 15 years, we're, we're, we're finally uh, ready to begin this project. So we're working with Metro and Cortex and some of the other partners on you know, how the phasing of this will actually happen. We're hoping to start uh, design work uh, later in the summer in 2016. 
I'm sorry, 2015, and uh, with the intent that construction starts in 2016 and we're open in 2017 when the station opens. Um, you know, this first portion, again, would be within a, a metro right-of-way, and um, our hope is that we don't just do this one block, but we've got the ability to, you know, go several blocks beyond in, in both directions and really provide uh, more connections in, um, you know, both to the east and the west. This is a project um, that Cortex is currently looking at with their de development partner, Wexford. And as I mentioned before, you know, part of our intent is that we're not in the backyard, we're not in the alley of uh, some of these developments, but that they will start to use the Greenway as a, an incentive or as an amenity and how they're going to front new, new properties. And so some of their first uh, schemes for how they want to redevelop this site put all the parking garage parking garages against the, the Metrolink tracks. The latest scheme that they have um, uh, shared actually includes residential on the backside. And so they're already acknowledging that there's an amenity that, that's, that's, that's um, you know, cr being created with the, uh, with the commons and with the greenway. Um, and then just some other uh, renderings. Some of the goals that we have for the Midtown Loop, I'm, I'm just about finished here. Um, we, we definitely want to enhance, enhance the, the campus and the neighborhood character and its identity, um, and then really create these uh, social spaces um, you know, that are otherwise kind of forgotten about and you know, do a high-quality public realm, encourage high-quality uh, healthy lifestyles, um, providing transportation alternatives is really, really critical. And through doing that, we hope to reduce uh, the, the huge demand for parking and circulation, running shuttle buses, and you know some of the problems that the district is facing right now. And we want to appeal to a huge variety of users. You know, um, and we're doing counts on our trails throughout the region right now. And one of the things that we're learning is that there's a vast diversity of, of people um, who use our trails, elderly and young, um, people using for recreation or for commuting, um, et cetera. And then you know, we definitely want to help use this as a way to market the district, you know, for those knowledge workers that are that are looking for, you know, this kind of, of uh, urban environment. Um, and so for each one of those goals, we just have a little bit of imagery. These are places not in St. Louis, but you know, just to give you an idea of the kinds of quality, uh, the kinds of uh, you know space that we would like to to create, you know, change the identity of the place. It's not just about a street. It's not just about an alley. But this is really about creating a, a linear park through an urban environment. Um, creating, you know, interesting social spaces in places that otherwise would have been, you know, an alley or a parking lot. You know, this is in uh, uh, Faithville, Arkansas, I believe. And, you know, these are spaces that people go to. They, they, they can, you know, share ideas and, and have lunch or whatever. And it wouldn't exist if the trail wasn't there. Um, just by giving people more walkable uh, places, we're going to you know, change uh, people's habits. And so there's a lot of latent demand that you know people would walk, they would bike if the facilities are there, if they're inviting, if they're safe, and if they connect to the things where they want to go. Um, it, providing people you know, commuter alternatives, I can't you know emphasize this enough. We're working a lot with Metro and with Citizens for Modern Transit um, to provide connections to the greenways because we're seeing more and more and more people are using. The, the greenways to get to Metro and using Metro to get to the greenways. And it's really, um, they, they work very, very well in conjunction with each other. And we see this all over the, the country. Um, and then reducing parking demand. You know, if we provide people those safe and convenient connections between destinations, they're more likely to either leave their car at home or when they arrive to their destination, they can at least circulate throughout this very large district without hopping into a car, um, and that you know they're more likely to use bike share or to to uh, to walk or or um, um, use transit. Um, as I said before, a variety of users, and we see this all over the place. There are the, the you know the hardcore bicyclists next to families, next to elderly, next to you know the the, uh, the workers. Um, these facilities really serve everybody. It's not an elitist thing. You know this is this is really um, especially in an urban environment. Um, where you are connecting to a variety of, of destinations, these facilities are designed and, and intended to be used by everybody. And then finally, um, you know, district competitiveness. This is a shot from New York City. St. Louis is competing on the global stage for those workers. And when Cortex and BJC, Wash U are out there marketing, you know, at St. Louis University and the Botanical Garden, when they're marketing their facility and their neighborhood, 
these are some of the things that those workers, those researchers, and those students are looking for. They want to be in, a, in an environment where it is active and it's social, and they can, you know, they can be outdoors and everything. And you know, St. Louis can't compete unless we can offer the same thing that these other uh, cities and regions are offering. So, um, before we start on questions, I'm going to answer the another answer to the last question from the previous um, about um, the where how do we do this? How do we do stormwater? Um, um, you know, strategies throughout uh, other parts of the, the, the city. And, you know, the greenways, that's another opportunity for us. You know, it's a long-term vision. I mean, we're, we're looking at a 50-year at a implementation of a lot of these greenways, and this one alone has been, you know, on the books for a long time. So, you know, we can't promise these things happen overnight, but they are a comprehensive strategy. And so as MSD um, is implementing more and more regulations and is looking for partners and we're looking for partnerships, um, you know, we're, we're always open to, to you know, collaborating with public and private uh, and nonprofit groups, you know, to, to build those facilities. So, yes? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. The question is, um, can you describe how Great Rivers Greenway and other organizations, um, you know, have an open dialogue, you know, for projects like this? Because it doesn't just happen with, you know, within the, the closed walls of our office. Um, all of our projects uh, incorporate public input in some way or another. Um, and it really starts with um, the regional plan that was conducted in 2002, 2004, and then the regional plan update that was completed um, in 2010. Um, there are regional discussions about, you know, the, the goals of the district and how we should be, you know, using public resources. And then within each one of our, our greenways, we have, you know, master planning efforts that, you know, have a public engagement aspect to it. It's both public engagement and we typically also will have um, technical advisory committees uh, that, that, you know, help out and provide input on, you know, the technical aspects of, you know, stormwater or, um, you know, utilities or, uh, you know, fundraising. There, there's a lot, a lot of different uh, things that incorporate. And, you know, TrailNet and other nonprofits have, have always been a, a really strong partner in ours in doing that. Specifically to the Shoto uh, project, because it's been kind of on the horizon, we haven't been close to implementation, it's been light on that, uh, quite honestly. And so we actually have a, uh, a public engagement um, process that will be um, beginning in the next month or two for the Hodemont line because again that was a project that really came to us uh, fairly recently from Metro and so we have not engaged the the communities where where that uh, where that corridor exists right now but that's that's a process that will be beginning uh, very soon. Yes, sir. Okay. The question was uh, where. Where does the budget come from to maintain all these greenways? Um, and the it would, I'm sorry, and the workforce. And the workforce. Um, every every location in the region is a little bit different for us, of course, um, and it's a it's a problem and it's a it's a it's an issue that we face, you know, all over. Um, when the district first started uh, developing greenways, really the priority was to spend you know the the you know the most of of you know, the public resources on. You know, our budget on on building the greenway. When we updated the regional plan a couple of years ago, we identified that promoting and sustaining the greenways were rising in importance as well. And so, when you see a, a long-term trend of the way that we budget our resources, you know, we continue to increase our budgets for for maintenance. Now, we don't begin a project unless we have a maintenance agreement in place, and it's typically with the are in communities that have high capacity, you know, they have a really very, very strong tax base, and some that are just, you know, barely getting by. And if they don't have enough money for police and fire and schools, you know, greenways are not a top priority. And so there are some locations where the district is actually, you know, spending more resources. We also have a, a new, uh, new um, um, department within Gray Rivers Greenway um, called Conservation and Community Service, where we're focusing more on uh, that kind of, you know, you know, thing, how we're going to help communities uh, looking to do more volunteer work, looking to, um, you know, use, um, you know, contract out for, you know, other types of, of um, uh, ongoing maintenance. We're also looking to um, partner more with, you know, the Department of Conservation and other groups that can help us be more sustainable so that our, our demands for um, maintenance are lower. And when you're done, if you turn to the gentleman to your left, he can tell you a lot more about that. 
<laughs> so, yes. Okay. The, the, the question is, uh, if I could address um, shrinking, you know, doing uh, road diets, you know, that, that's one term, but uh, reducing unneeded traffic lanes to, to give back to, um, to have more open space. And it's true, I, I didn't mention it specifically in, in, uh, in this one. Primarily, you know, the corridor that we're using is, is along Metrolink. Um, but we, we are, um, we're, we just finished a, a um, the Bike St. Louis um, uh, master plan, which is doing that throughout the, the city right now. Um, there are some locations where we are, you know, collaborating with St. Louis City and St. Louis County to do some, some reductions of lanes uh, where possible. And I'll go back. Um, I, I do have uh, one location here where I can uh, describe where we're doing that in this corridor. Okay, so this is along Taylor Avenue. And keep in mind, you know, if you've gone through the medical district at four or five o'clock in the afternoon, a lot of these streets are already choked. And um, we don't have authority to close roads typically. You know, we, we work with partners on, on doing that. Um, part of this project was led by SWT. Um, we also had the Lock Miller Group, a, a very, very good traffic consultant who helped with this project. And part of the, uh, the decision for going along the corridors that we did was to enable us to use some of these roads where we think that we could do a road diet. And so this is Taylor Avenue, which is currently four lanes, uh, two northbound, two southbound. And their traffic model, because of a 3,000 car parking garage that BJC is currently building, their tra and, the, and I'm sorry, the, uh, the new interchange at Tower Grove and I-64, um, their traffic model is showing that there's gonna be a huge influx of, of cars in one direction in the morning, and then a huge outflux in the afternoon, outflow in the afternoon, okay, down Newstead. So we're pretty confident that on Taylor, we need to maintain, you know, these North Brown lanes for the morning rush, but we're not gonna have the same um, you know, traffic jam in the afternoon that we see today. So this is one quarter where we actually are pushing the curb out and trying to claim some of that land for a wider sidewalk and you know, a little bit of landscape. It's still, the, the, some of these roads are extremely narrow. And you know, in a, a location like this, you know, traffic is, is, is a mess. But we do have a lot of, of uh, corridors, Morgan Ford, uh, you know, Tower Grove and others that, uh, Manchester, you know, just around the corner from here where we've implemented uh, uh, road diets. And um, you know, they're, I think that it's the way to go, but it's kind of a, uh, you know, show me sort of a thing that, um, you know, we, we put them in and, you know, people want to see how they, how they work and how they function. They really have uh, impacts. You know, Grand Center has, has talked about doing that as well in, in a number of locations, so. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Once again, want to thank our speakers tonight, Heather Woofter, Sung Ho Kim of Axiomi, Mark Vogel of Great Rivers Greenway District, and Paul Tenius of SWT Design. Thank you very much for your interest in biodiversity and connecting people to nature and looking at ways that we can transform how we think about economic development and have nature move more to the forefront of that equation. I'm Jean Ponzi for the Missouri Botanical Garden. Very much appreciate your coming tonight. Thanks.